Uh, I think we have nailed, and it's all circumstantial at this point, you know, it's just like an accumulation of evidence that seems to suggest that the uh, man that we uh, spotted here, in fact, was that CIA agent. And the red flag was, is his name kept popping up as I read through the diary. You know, suddenly here's this guy, he's in Cairo. <laughs> then the next time he pops up, he's having lunch and drinks with Malcolm, you know, in uh, Kenya. The next thing you know, he's in Khartoum. Then he's in East Africa. You know, he's in Ethiopia with it. I said, wait a minute, why is this guy popping up everywhere that Malcolm is? Now, I don't know if this ever dawned on Malcolm. You know, because I think one of the things in any autobiography, Malcolm talks about being shadowed under surveillance by FBI and the CIA. But he thought it was a white man. <laughs> well, I think you can get a spook on your trail, too. And this was a black man. His name was Leo Milets. That's a name that kept popping up all the time in these different locations. And so I did the research on him. In this day and age, you can Google anything, can't you? <laughs> and I traced him all the way back. I thought I'd heard the name before because of my interest in African liberation struggles. Um, so I went that route first. And lo and behold, I traced him all the way back to Frelimo, which is the front for the liberation movement in Mozambique. And he was a member of that formation. And they booted him out of it because they dis discovered that he was a foreign agent. Now this is 1962. So they boot him out. So what's going to be his next assignment? He's already in East Africa, right? Here's Malcolm traveling around East Africa a year and a half later. So his next assignment, we uh, suspect, is that he's now put on the trail of Malcolm X, this man who's caused in all of this controversy, particularly in terms of the kind of uh, recognition, uh, appreciation that he's receiving from these African dignitaries. You know, that makes him very, 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 very powerful and dangerous for the U.S. government. So we got to find out, what is he up to? And in fact, if you can do anything to, to disrupt, disturb, offset, interfere, you know, create problems and mischief, then you do so. You have every right to do so. Now, we know that Malcolm had a couple of moments there you know, where his stomach went raw on him. But any of you who've traveled know you have to be very careful about what you eat. And on a couple of occasions, it could have been just a matter of eating the wrong thing. But again, you know, it could have been some dropped in his food or drink too. Because he's sitting and eating with this Leo Miles on a number of occasions. And any kind of dysentery or, you know, having diarrhea, and Malcolm had almost persistent diarrhea. Now, so, you know, that comes from like, you know, he's, he was told by people in Saudi Arabia that you ate the food out of season. You had the wrong food. Uh, but he felt that, and Milton Henry, who was traveling with him, Brother Gaidi, felt that he had been poisoned, you know. Whatever the case is, this Leo Miles is a very suspicious individual who's popping up. And I trace him all the way back to Frelimo. And then I follow and look at his career. Who is this guy? Of course, Leo Miles was a, a pseudonym. I mean, that was not his name. His name was Leo Clinton Aldrich. <laughs> right, Danny? <laughs> Leo Clinton Aldrich, who was born in Texas, who, 18 years of age, he was at the University of Southern California. He was in, in Hollywood. He starred in a movie called The White Witch Doctor with Susan Hayward, you know, and Robert Mitchell. And so right away you have this guy in his acting career, right? 
you know. So that may have been part of this whole development in terms of the pretense in his life, you know, not being who he really is. You see, again, this is circumstantial. This is kind of like suspicion on our part as we make a case against him. But I think the most outstanding aspect is that you are talking about someone who, by any means, he's moving around, who's paying for all of this. You know, is he working as a journalist? And of course, that could have been a cover for him. Uh, because on a couple of occasions, you do have him sitting there interviewing Malcolm. So he's making that pretense again. So here's this actor, more or less, who gets close to Malcolm in such a way that I feel that, and of course, he's still alive. As a matter of fact, I've been in communication with him. He has no idea what I'm up to, though. You know, I haven't divulged to say, hey, man, I want to ask you some questions about, you know, your background and everything. And whether or not you get into a liability, and in terms of libel, and, uh, and scandal because you may be defaming someone and call, making them be something that they were not. Uh, but however, he'd have to come out and say that. So once we get him out there, he'd say, oh, oh no, I was never a CIA agent. You know, that of course, that's a whole nother can of worms we'd have to get into to find out and prove that, okay, give us the whole track record because this guy was changing jobs every two years. And all connected with the United Nations, uh, with sometimes with uh, UNICEF, you know, sometimes with the United States AID. So those are kind of these shadow figures, how they move in governmental affairs in order to get close to various institutions and organizations. So that's one of the revelations we have there. Uh, that has a long discussion, probably the longest discussion in the diary, the longest commentary we have there. And you can see the, the diary is laid out in such a way as that we do not interfere, the house and I stay clear of interfering with Malcolm's words. Sometimes when it, some clarification is needed, typos were corrected to a certain degree. But for the most part, it stands exactly as he wrote it. And you have a feeling that Malcolm was writing this book for posterity. It was more than just some jotting down some notes, you know, some itinerary. You know, because he had told Paul Reynolds early on, who was his agent, that the uh, possibility that this here diary could be a book. And Alex Haley used extensively, he, he, he took a, a lot of stuff from the diary and Malcolm gave it to him, you know, but it, it hardly compares to the amount of material that he left behind, and perhaps deliberately so. So as you have this here magnificent thinker, this world traveler, our leader, the Shining Prince, as Ossie Davis called him, you know, someone who, who was determined you know, in all of this here, we talk about the people who be, had gone before, the William Pattersons, and begin to talk about we charge genocide. Well, see, Malcolm was on the same trail in terms of uh, bringing the U.S. government to the world court and charging them, you know, with the same question that Patterson talked about in terms of genocide, general violation of our, of our uh, social, civil, and human rights. So he had that particular mission in mind when he was doing all of this here. And of course, when you're doing that kind of job, you know, you put yourself in the crosshairs and it made himself a larger target. Uh, one of the uh, people who joined us in this endeavor in the diary is uh, Reverend James Cone. And he, um, he wrote a book and it talked about the conversion tra trajectory of the lives of Malcolm, you know, and Martin Luther King. And, and as you read through the diary, you can get these little instances, these hints of Malcolm's changing attitude, you know, about how he deal with the civil rights leaders, because he used to call them, you know, the whole the gang of six. And he was very rough on them, you know. But he began to ease up on that. And toward the end of his, end of his life, you can see that he began to reach out the olive branch was being extended. You get elements and instances of that popping up in the diary. For John Lewis, for example, when he's traveling across Africa at that time, he meets with Malcolm. Later on, uh, and Malcolm is back to the few, the last days of 64 and into parts of 65, you know, he goes to Selma, 
meeting again with, an, uh, with the hopes of meeting with uh, Malcolm down there. Did not have it at Brown. He spoke at Brown Memorial Chapel. You know, uh, of course, Dr. King was in jail at that time, right, Danny? He was in jail at that time. But he, he spent time with Coretta. And Malcolm told Coretta, you know, I got your back. You know, and so it was, it was understanding of Fannie Lou Hamer later on in New York when they had the panels and everything, and they were together there. So it's every indication that Malcolm was beginning to change in so many very interesting and dynamic ways, and moving more and more as uh, Martin was moving more and more toward him too, because of what he did with the whole uh, striking garbage workers down in Memphis, more of a class position, more than just race to say nothing of his outspoken position on the war in Vietnam. So a whole international perspective was coming together. So all in all, gang, we're talking about um, two books there, By Any Means Necessary, which brings so much more than just a critique of Manning Marable. Because you have all these scholars who are coming together, and you know, it's more than them just taking on Manning, but they got something to say beyond that. And then the diary comes in to supplement that. There's still more Malcolm stuff to be done. The letters, you know, the, he, was a, he, wrote, he was a copious letter writer. And I hear that one of the daughters have been thinking about it for 2015, coming out with the letters that Malcolm left behind. Then there's the films. Malcolm kept a camera with him all the time. You know, some of, some of those, uh, some of the footage is in the hands of uh, one of our noted uh, Malcolm X authorities in Detroit, Paul Lee. He has some of that footage. But it's still so much of that raw footage is at the Schaumburg hasn't been developed yet. We need to get the money to get that stuff because it's very perishable. You have to hurry up to start. Next time you open that can up and, and, and it oxidizes, it's all, it'll vanish on you in a minute, just like paper will crumble after so many touches if you don't laminate and protect it. But that's where I stand, you know, with Malcolm and, of course, uh, Black Detroit. You know, beyond Malcolm, and when you connect Malcolm and Detroit, they come together. You know, you talk about the man from Harlem with a Detroit walk. <laughs> and, uh, as one noted poet said in one of her poems. <laughs> <laughs> But that connection, I think, is a very vital one, you know. And I almost, I guess, in a way, stand symbolically in the same way, you know, I try to straddle. Just as I did back in those days at Wayne State University, right? You know, hey, one, one foot in the grassroots, and one foot in the ivory tower, you dig it? And try to connect those things. I try to keep one foot in Harlem and one foot in Detroit as much as I can. And so long as I have friends, and relatives, and this this turnout here is is certainly it typifies what I feel about the resurgence and the resilience, you know, of our community, because I think all of you, in some way or another, are interested in the preservation, you know, and a comprehensive discussion of the importance of Black history and of Malcolm X. I testified, y'all. <laughs> Quick question. Do you know anything about the status of the um, photographs and the material that Milton Henry had? Hmm. Uh, Milton Henry, slightly before his death, he and I were supposed to do a book together on Malcolm. Mm -hmm. He had the entire uh, photographs of the whole trip to Egypt and all of that. Yes. And he had, as I know, he had six. I know he had four. He had four um, drawers of nothing but mountain photographs mm. and pictures. And uh, the last discussion I had about them, they were uh, his his wife had a Marilyn had them. So I've never heard anyone ever talk about them. Mm. I'm just wondering if someone could approach Marilyn or approach Malcolm. I think I think he has a daughter named Sharon. I can't remember. She, she had one child. Mm -hmm. So um, that might be a place to to check out. Indeed. Uh, oh, thank you. Yeah, I, oh, it certainly is true in terms of the the kind of stuff that's out there. 
And, and what's the, the Schomburg, in fact, there's one great photo of Malcolm getting off the plane. You know, it's a Pan African Airlines. Pan African. Pan American Airlines. They call it Pan African Airlines. <laughs> PAA, right? And Milton is right there, right? That is a magnificent shot of the kind of camaraderie, the kind of relationship they had, the respect and love they had for each other. Um, in one book, uh, Carl Evans, it's in his book, The Judas Factor, she makes a kind of a terrible mistake there in terms of trying to understand who Milton Henry was in terms of struggle. Some of the record, some of the stuff that's gotten out there that needs to be corrected too, beyond what needs to be put out there, but what stuff has been put out there that's incorrect, you know, about that relationship. And certainly uh, getting to the family and finding out exactly what materials could be useful as you expand you know, the whole understanding of what, who Malcolm was and what he represented. I think that would be a significant addition to the canon. We need to do that. Uh, of course, you know, his brother could have helped us, you know, brother or uh, Mario Vidali, or, you know, the other brother, Lawrence. Lawrence. Yeah, yeah. They, could, they could probably, or family members. And that's what your know, research pro projects are all about in terms of finding out where is that key source you know, in a particular family that can help you tell the story. Because see, see, when Malcolm did his autobiography, he did it without necessarily having a solid consultation with his siblings. You know, he just went ahead and did that. And so you had a lot of controversy there, you know, people who say, look, he didn't get that right at all. You know what I'm saying? Daddy, you, we've talked about that before, haven't we? Okay, let me get here. Thank you. HB. How you feel? My name is Norman Thrasher, and Malcolm and I were very good oh, friends. Wow, okay. That's a picture that he and I took in 1959. Mm -hmm. And so, and prior to that, I, I met him in 57. I've been in the entertainment business. And so he and I walked. Uh, I think I'll take this. <laughs> 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 chicken place that discovered Jim Brown in Los Angeles. You know, and uh, he and I had been friends when he met uh, Dr. Betty. So uh, when people talk about Malcolm, you know, I knew him. I was there at the temple the night that John Belize Muhammad called and told him to talk about President Kennedy. Yes. I was there with him that evening, you know. So as you see the picture, that picture was taken in 1959, mm -hmm. and I was in my early 20s then. Yes. I'm 81 now. So God has blessed me to be able to, be able to, to talk and, and bear witness to the truth of what things are about. You know, let so, hold it. Let him hold it. Well, we can hold it. Okay, come oh, no, 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 come on. Yeah, no, come on. Sure. <laughs> 1959. This is the same year that uh, Mike Wallace did the hate that he produced, right? Right. It gave him right. that national notoriety. Were you in L.A. when they had the, uh, the situation out there with the young man who was uh, who was killed? No, but around. No, yes. I, I had just left. Mm -hmm. I had just left, and um, uh, this was the Joe Lewis's record company. Mm -hmm. And um, I just um, Joe Lewis had all kind of enterprises. Oh yeah, didn't he? Oh, my goodness. Yeah. I like just discovered the other day he had a the Paradise Alley had a bowling alley. Yeah. Well, Sonny was he did a rock and roll hall of fame. Uh huh. Yeah. That's the great one, the rock and roll hall of fame. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I'm